You are listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. Sustainable World Radio brings you in-depth interviews, news, and commentary about positive solutions to environmental challenges. Solutions that adhere to the permaculture ethics of earth care, people care, fair share. Are you interested in learning more about permaculture projects around the globe? How to plant a food forest? Restorative design or ethnobotany? Then stay tuned for Sustainable World Radio. I'm your host and producer, Jill Cloutier. My guest today is Michael Judd, permaculture designer, natural builder, teacher, and author. Michael is the founder of Ecologia Edible and Ecological Landscape Design and of Project Bonafide, an international nonprofit supporting agroecology research. Michael is also the author of the book Edible Landscaping with a Permaculture Twist and founder of the annual Long Creek Homestead Paw Paw Festival in Frederick, Maryland. Welcome back to the show, Michael. As always, it's so good to have you here. Thanks, Jill. And to talk about Paul Pauls has me very excited. Uh, me too. And I want to tell listeners today, instead of, you may have heard Michael on the show before, and we usually have free-ranging, multi-topic conversations. Today, we're going to be focusing on one thing and one thing alone, and that is something, Michael, that's near and dear to your heart, and that is the pawpaw. You wrote about pawpaws in your first book, and you've been growing them for years, and you actually, I saw a video online, you converted an old chicken coop into this really cute, charming um, pawpaw nursery. You started a pawpaw festival, and now you're writing a new book about this fruit called For the Love of Pawpaws. What is it about pawpaws that has enraptured you so much? The, the pawpaw has a really deep taproot, uh, much like a nut tree. And it's woodland, it's, it's, it's come out of the woods. And I think there's some draw there that uh, has me connecting with the pawpaw, aside from its fantastic fruit. Um, you know, there's a connection with something deep and mm-hmm. old uh, that I think a lot of us are being drawn to, you know, as the world speeds up. You know, because I ask myself this question a lot, you know, why am I so crazy about the pawpaw? Why am I dedicating so much of my life and time and energy to the pawpaw? And I think a lot of it really is a connection, uh, a connection to the woods, connection to something ancient. Um, Yeah, I'm working on that one. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Something that's endured for for thousands of years. And I, I know the pawpaw has a really interesting history. And I've I used to sing a song about them when I was a little girl, and there's poems about pawpaws, and there's a lot of towns in the Midwest named after pawpaws. Can you just briefly tell us just a little bit of the interesting history of um, this fruit? Yeah, the pawpaw is a relative of the tropical custard apple, uh, and the cherimoya, and the soursop, and it is basically a tropical tree that has migrated back with the receding glaciers into North America and over thousands of years has made its way to our, you know, woods here. And and it's native to about 26 of the U.S. states and is now being grown outside of that range and really all around the world. Um, But it's really naturalized here. And typically it's found in the woods as an understory tree or as a patch. You might have heard it being called a pawpaw patch. Mm -hmm. They'll kind of sucker and create a patch in the understory. Now, when that comes out to the edge of the woods and it gets sunlight, it's able to fruit. And the fruit is exquisite. It is uh, like a custardy, banana, mango, pineapple flavored uh, dessert. It's really like nothing else that's growing up here in the north. It's a real anomaly. Um, And the fact that it grows very well and very carefree and is a beautiful sort of edible landscape uh, tree has a lot to be celebrating about it. So it's, it's, um, it's rightfully, you know, having a renaissance. Mm -hmm. And isn't the pawpaw North America's largest indigenous fruit? 
Yes, I like that word indigenous more than native. Um, so yes, it, it is. I, um, and when you grow a pawpaw, like if you're growing a select pawpaw, and we can get into the differences between wild and sort of cultivated, because uh, they've come quite a far way, uh, really in the last hundred years or so. And if you're growing a select pawpaw in full sun and good conditions, you know it'll be the size of a large mango. Uh, sometimes upwards of two pounds, you know, one fruit, two pounds, huge. Um, so yes, it, it, it can be very abundant um, and and large. <laughs> and delicious, which I got to try one thanks to you. Um, you sent one in the mail to me and it was really unusual. Cherimoya-ish plus, like you said, banana and mango and just so delicate and the skin was so soft and delicate and it didn't look like much like when I opened it up and I remember you said wait until it gets really brown looking and ripe looking and then you just slice it open and it, it was heaven really delicious so I can see how people become devoted to this fruit uh, yeah I think I think fanatic might be more the word it's, <laughs> it's interesting you know it's like with bamboo um, you know, Paul Paul has, has its own followers, and, and not everybody likes it. Some people are kind of turned off by the texture, uh, which surprises me because it is just very much like custard. Now, the experience of Paul Paul's can vary widely from, you know, eating a wild Paul Paul that might have strong uh, bitter notes to it um, to, you know, a select sweet one. And the timing of the ripeness is important too. So a lot of people who experience pawpaws have found them on the ground, you know, days after they've fallen and ripened, and it might be a wild one. And really that can, that can be a real hit or miss experience. Um, so working with the pawpaw and cultivating it and harvesting it at the right time can create a really beautiful experience. Um, and you definitely do not want to eat a pawpaw before it's ripe. Uh, that'll, that'll, <laughs> that'll clean you out. <laughs> and not good. And I also know you don't want to eat the seeds, right? Correct. Yeah. In, in the same vein there, it, it has a lot of strong medicinal qualities. It's not, you know, it's not going to kill you, but uh, it, it will, it will purify you. <laughs> Which is a, <laughs> yes, we, we you can hear what you're saying. So let's talk about some, before we dive into how to grow pawpaws and care for them and harvest them, let's talk about some of the many virtues of pawpaws. So we talked a bit about their history and the delicious fruit. And can you tell us a bit about um, the nutrition, nu nutritional value of the fruit? Yeah, it, it has like a perfect amino acid profile. I think it's like one of the only fruits that has that. Um, it's got high potassium, magnesium. I mean, it, it blows away most of our domestic and even our grocery store fruits. It, it's really actually hard to eat more than one pawpaw at a go. And part of that is its its richness, it's the dessert-like quality. It's very aromatic, so it's very satisfying. But I think it also, the body feels very satisfied very quickly, because you know, also because it has a lot of good fats in it. So it's really more of one of these wholesome, complete foods. You know, I, it reminds me in some ways of like the avocado. Uh, you know, it's something that you can eat when you're hungry and you're gonna be satisfied until the next meal. Uh, so it, it's it, apart from having, you know, some medicinal qualities as well, uh, it, it nutritionally is almost a super fruit. I know. And high in antioxidants, too, I read. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it, it, it has a short harvest period, but it freezes quite well. So it's something that can be frozen and put into smoothies every day, uh, makes beautiful ice cream. There's ways that it can kind of be spread throughout the year as as like a medicinal tasty, you know, fruit. And medicinally, too, um, I think there's research going on about the leaves and twigs that have cancer fighting properties. Yeah, they seem to have uh, somewhat of a, you know, a antimicrobial, uh, microbial and uh, parasitic effect, um, which is nice because it keeps the, the wildlife and the deer from eating the trees down as well. Um, but yeah, I think even South Korea has planted upwards of a million trees, mainly for its medicinal qualities. Uh, so a lot of a lot of uh, modern current research is going into exploring how to work with it. It's a magical tree. You know, the the fruit gets a lot of focus, but it has so many different elements to it and uses to it uh, that really make it in permaculture. You know, a really multi-purpose tree. 
uh, or I, I sometimes I sometimes call wonderful trees like this, you know, edible landscape all stars. Uh, <laughs> just for yeah, just for hitting so many different home runs with with how useful uh, and beneficial it is. And it really is a beautiful tree, right? I've I've seen one at a garden here in California, and it, I'm sure it wasn't in its natural. Um, it was it's too dry here, I think, for pawpaws. But it still was a really beautiful tree. I think it kind of has a pyramid shape, and the leaves change color. And yeah, it has almost like foot long, big lobed green leaves that that kind of like just naturally droop and hang. And when it's in full sun, you get a pyramid-shaped tree. If it's really happy, it might get 15, 20. I mean, I have seen them upward of 30, but that's that's less common. Um, in the woods, they'll grow in shade. They'll grow more like a patch, and they may only grow to about five or six feet tall and look very beautiful as an understory you know, tree there as well. So it kind of morphs and changes. It's very adaptable. Uh, obviously, it's, it's come up from the, you know, from the tropics to live here. Uh, it's ready to be worked with in a lot of different ways. And I, I keep my trees that I'm harvesting from at about eight feet tall very easily. Now, for most trees, I would never say, you know, just kind of lop the top off. Uh, but for the pawpaw, by keeping the top down, it really kind of reshapes itself nicely. It doesn't look hideous. And, you know, it really manages well with being pruned in that fashion so that they can fit into small spaces as well. Now, a typical spacing for planting pawpaws is 10 feet apart. So, you know, even if you have a sort of a small suburban or urban yard, you can fit a pair of pawpaws in quite easily. And then if you keep them at about seven or eight feet, you know, they really can squeeze in and they are beautiful. And then when they're full of fruit, it's not like they produce one or two fruits. If it's a good cultivar in full sun, you can get upwards of 50 pounds of fruit. Wow. So it's abundant and it's beautiful. And when it's hanging with fruit, it just even looks more attractive and exotic. Uh, you know, I plant these in, you know, HOAs and, you know, you know, urban restaurant settings. I mean, they are very beautiful and really not troubled by insects and diseases. So they really fit easily into a lot of different scenarios. Wow. So that and I guess the insects don't trouble them. Is it because of the anti-parasitic properties? I would say that would largely yeah. be it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and well, I read too online that you can it they make shampoo out of it to get rid of lice. Yeah, and it can be used as a sort of a natural pesticide, you know, by taking the twigs and the leaves and mashing that up and you know soaking it and using that as a spray. Uh, you know, if if you need to do that. Now, ideally you have a good balanced permaculture system that's taking care of you know, your, your insect ecology balance. But, you know, if you get into a little bit more of a large scale of something, you might need um, some supplements. Speaking of insects, uh, pawpaws are home to the zebra swallowtail butterfly. Can you tell us a bit about that? Oh, it is magical. It is magical. It is this white and black, like starkly white, starkly black, um, you know, striped uh, swallowtail butterfly. It, and when it comes out, in, they, they first start coming out in the early spring because the pawpaw tree is the host for, I think it's the only host for this um, swallowtail. And when a swallowtail flies in front of you, it's like your whole world stops. Whatever you were thinking about or planning, all of a sudden you are just following this beautiful creature around and, and you've entered into like this realm of magic. Uh, it's hard to explain. Uh, and and they are, they, I just learned this about them too. They have this proboscis, you know, like like butterflies have for, for eating uh, nectar, but it's like a spiral. So like, it, it, it's like a spiral that stays like coiled up and then when they want it, it comes out and goes into the flower <laughs> and, and is able to get nectar. And different than most butterflies, it can also collect pollen and, and consume that and allows them to live up to like six months in adult form. So very That's a long time, right, for a butterfly. It is. So, I mean, you know, they they really have some of that pawpaw magic going on. And now on our homestead here, you know, where I've got 60 plus pawpaw trees, they're starting to pop up all over the place. And it's just magical to watch these butterflies fly all around us. And they'll, some of them will start in early spring that have overwintered. 
and then there'll be some more in like sort of midsummer and there'll be some in fall, you know, that are coming out. So we'll have them, you know, almost the whole season now and they keep getting bigger. So the spring ones are, you know, sort of small and in the midsummer they're getting bigger and the fall they're even bigger. And it's just, yeah, it's <laughs> By in 10 years, you'll have these gigantic seagull sized butterflies. <laughs> uh, we might, we might. Let's talk about pawpaw care and how to start these trees. Do you recommend starting them from seeds or yes. and then grafting or buying them from a nursery? Tell us a bit about that. So you can easily start them by seeds. The seeds germinate, they have a high germination rate. So they germinate readily and well. The trick, the main thing is that they always stay moist. A pawpaw seed cannot dry out. If it dries out, it loses its germination, it dies. And that can even sometimes be just a couple of hours. The germination wow. rate will begin to drop as it dries. So as you're eating your delicious pawpaw, you want to take those seeds out and, you know, put them in a Ziploc bag and put them in your refrigerator. Now, some some people I know have kept them in Ziploc bags, you know, with nothing else added. You know, some people will put in like damp peat moss or a damp paper towel. But I have a good friend who grows pawpaws, and he says he just sticks them in the bag, and they're fine. Um, so you want to put it in your refrigerator, and you want to keep it cool, and you want to keep it moist. And it takes at least three months to go through stratification. You know, that's the you know the imitation of of sort of going through the winter outside, and they can go longer. So you know, we're harvesting a lot of our pawpaws in September here, but I'm just now getting ready, probably this week, to start germinating my seeds. So what's that? Five five months or so. So they'll last until you're ready to germinate them, basically. You can also plant them directly where you want to grow them. And there's benefits and challenges to that. The benefit is, you know, you, you're not moving it, you're never moving it, and any seed really is better off grown right where it's going to grow, especially tree seeds. Especially with the long tap root, right? Especially with the long tap root, so yes. Now, the challenge is, the seeds uh, take a long time to germinate naturally. Uh, so like if you put your seed in the ground in the fall and mulch it well so that that, that ground is going to stay moist for sure, uh, you may not see a shoot come up until July or August of the next year. Now that's a long time and you have to have some faith and you have to maintain the moisture and care for that spot. Uh, but what happens is once the seed germinates, it sends down a nine inch deep tap root before it ever even sends up a shoot. Oh. So it's hard to know that it's actually germinated to begin with, unless you do it the way I do it, which is a sped up way. And it only involves having a single heat mat. You know, I have a heat mat that's 12 by 24 inches, has a little thermometer on it, a little digital thermometer. And what I do, and you could do this on a smaller scale, but, you know, I germinate two to 400 seeds at a go with just this one little mat. And what I do is I get one of those uh, aluminum pans, like a turkey baster aluminum pan, kind of a deep pan. And I will take like a potting soil mix and I'll make sure it's damp. And I will put an inch of that on the bottom of the pan, the aluminum pan. And then I will go ahead and just put my seeds out one by one in rows. You know, I'll get almost 100. And then I'll put down another inch of a moist, you know, sort of potting soil mix. And I'll do another row. Sometimes I'll go three and I'll do three rows, right? Then I'll take an, another aluminum pan and I'll flip it on top of it as a lid. Oh, I love this idea. Yeah. And then I put the whole thing on the heating mat. And, and, I, and, and then I set my temperature for the heating mat to 85 degrees. And basically, I forget about it. And I come back 14 days later, and my seeds are germinating. Ooh. Almost all of them. Do you have to water it, though? Well, No, I don't. I mean, it doesn't hurt to keep an eye on it. As long as your medium is well, uh, is, is good and moist, um, you're fine. And the lid, you know, putting that lid on top of it is, is help capturing that like a little greenhouse yeah you can like a little greenhouse and you know i do this in the dark i don't have a greenhouse um really the only thing i have is that heating mat and i grow hundreds of pawpaws it's, it's really cool it's very low tech um you know you could do a smaller scale now if you didn't have a heating mat or didn't want to buy one you know have your soil in a pot indoors you know have it you know room temperature as warm as your house can be and go ahead and direct plant your seed into your pots 
and you know you might be looking more at like a month for that beginning germination right and remember so when it first germinates so when i have them in that turkey you know basting pan and they start to germinate they just start to open up and they stick out this little this little root tail I want to get them as fast as I as I can because that root starts to grow very quickly and it's very fragile. I mean, just barely touching it breaks it. So I like to grab them right away and then I stick them into the deep pots that I'm going to grow them in. Now I grow them in 12 inch pots because remember that root goes nine inches before it even sends up a shoot. So I don't want to compromise that root at all. And so I, I'll direct transplant them into pots, which I've had, you know, indoors, um, you know, up to room temperature, you know, maybe 65 degrees or so. And I'll plant into that. And I'll even do that in the dark. I do a lot of this in, in, in a boiler room. So pitch black. <laughs> First time I did this, I was like, I hope this works. I'm, I'm totally going out on a limb here. Put it, I put them in there. And then it will take usually at that temperature another, like another four weeks for that tap root to grow down, and then it'll start to send up a shoot. So under these ideal conditions, uh, it's gonna take about six weeks until that shoot comes up. Now, as soon as that shoot comes up, then I'm taking them outside. Um, you know, he, we're here in Maryland. You know, we kind of, our end frost date is early May. I will start these next week. It's about mid-March. Um, by, you know, around April 1st, they'll be germinated. I'll put them in my pots. By May 1st, they're going to start to shoot. It'll be perfect time for me to pull them outside and not be worried, and they'll start to grow. So that's that's my little rhythm with it. You could start them earlier if you if you only had a few and you had some you know some window light that you wanted. You could probably in January you could the seeds would have have stratified by then. You could start them if you have a greenhouse. I have friends who start them in January um, and get kind of a head start on it. But yeah, that's that's my method for uh, germinating them. I like it. You're repurposing those pans too, which is really great. Now, are pawpaws, um, are they a river fruit, like a tree? Do they grow by rivers and do they like their feet to be wet? I mean, I'm, I'm just curious about, yeah. well, that's one question. And then the second is the long taproot sounds so unusual, right? For a plant to really put all that energy into that. Yeah, it's, it's part of its magic. Um, I think it's part of what makes it really special in many ways. Um, but for sighting pawpaws, so they are commonly found in sort of uh, low riparian zones, you know, along streams and creeks and rivers, but they are not in the wet parts, you know, so a lot of mm -hmm. floodplains have, have very high water tables uh, and can be very wet soils. The pawpaw does not want to be in that sort of continually wet soil. It wants to be next to it. It wants to be sort of on the river bank, so where it's got drainage, but it has access to all that moisture. Now, when you have a leaf as large as the pawpaw, it's going to need a lot of humidity to maintain that. It's going to evapotranspirate a lot of moisture. So a lot of times you can tell where a plant has developed based on its leaf size. So you think about mesquite from the desert, very small leaves, you know, they're, they're, they're protecting themselves from, you know, from evapotranspirating too much moisture. Now you take the huge pawpaw leaf and it's growing as an understory uh, in, the, in the woods, lots of, you know, moisture and humidity. So you want to sort of work within that, you know, need of the tree, which means, you know, not having it windy sites, you know, making sure that it has access to moisture, but again, not sitting in sort of a heavy, wet soil. So pawpaws like to have their, to be, remain moist, but not totally saturated with water. So well-draining soil. And what are the temperatures? What are pawpaws like as far as um, temperatures and climate? So if we take the USDA agricultural zones, uh, they grow between zone five and zone nine. And so they're quite hardy. Uh, they'll actually go to negative 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, but you're really going to struggle to get a to fruit in the colder parts of where they will grow. Coming more into zone six is where you'll be able to start getting your fruiting because they like, they like humidity. They like warmth. So they like warm to hot summers with humidity, which is exactly what we have here sort of in, in the mid-Atlantic region. I mean, it's, it's basically tropical here in the summertime. That can be played with 
and there are microclimates in some of the colder parts, and there are outside of its its humidity range that can they can be grown in protected areas as long as they have good access to moisture, lots of mulch. And now that goes for wind too. So they 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 don't like to be in windy exposed sites because that's also going to pull away the the moisture that they need uh, to maintain that huge leaf size. Um, so its natural range can be extended, and I think it's kind of a a really fun uh, horticultural challenge and tree to work with. I think that's what draws a lot of us to it. Uh, is to see how how we can work with this really unique and very adaptable species that has not been really sort of experimented with very much. So that you know we have real opportunities to be kind of part of of of, of this history and and spreading this abundance. That's exciting, I bet, to be part of shaping how the pawpaw, new cultivars and trying out different things. And I think pawpaws are spreading. Um, we have listeners all around the world, and I think they're in Australia. And are they making their way around the globe as we speak? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, Neil Peterson is the is the guru, the godfather uh, of pawpaw breeding. Um, and he's a friend of mine and lives not too far uh, from me here in West Virginia. He has come up with six... Of really six of the best uh, pawpaw cultivars out there. They're known as Peterson's pawpaws. He recently got an international patent so that now he can sell those and is selling those in Europe, uh, in Asia, yes, in Japan and Korea. So it, it's really kind of catching fire. I think there's even more experimentation uh, horticulturally out there to see where and how it's going to do well in parts of Europe. I enjoy my conversations with him, like, well, what's the latest from Scandinavia? And I was sitting with him here in our house the other day, and he gets a, an email from Russia saying they, they would they would like to work with him on developing the pawpaws there. And, and so it, it's exciting because it, it is, uh, you know, sort of on the forefront with the humans uh, and, and how we're now working with it. I, I think it evolved with the macro fauna, you know, the the, the the large elephants and things historically, and now that they're gone, you know, I think the pawpaw is kind of drawing us in as humans. <laughs> <laughs> We're the closest thing to the woolly mammoth. <laughs> right, right. Well, I mean, you know, how can we spread? I mean, I'm, I'm definitely a believer in, uh, you know, being influenced uh, by the plants and not just us controlling everything. So they could be running the show. <laughs> yes, yes. We'd be better off. <laughs> so, Michael, let's talk a bit about how you use permaculture and use pawpaws in permaculture design? Uh, the way that I work with the pawpaw in permaculture and in my food forest systems, and I've done some hybrid agroforestry orchards for clients, is, you know, I work with swales, uh, which they love. They love sitting on swales. Uh, the growth that I get out of pawpaws on swales is not quite, but almost devil, you know, trees right nearby, not on swales. Um, so, you know, and then of course, lots of mulch and lots of ground cover, um, you know, that are, that are maintaining that moisture, feeding that soil cycle, fixing fertility for it. Uh, I find, you know, that you can really stretch the limits of where the pawpaw might grow by using permaculture techniques. And so let's get back, um, and then we'll talk more about permaculture and pawpaws, permaculture design and pawpaws. But I want to get back to, so you have your little seedlings, right? And they, they've sprouted. You put them in big pots. And that also brings me to the fact that I have seen pawpaws in nurseries in tiny little four-inch pots. Is that like a big no-no? That's, that, is, that is a sad story. Uh, and and it's, an, it's an issue I have with the nursery industry uh, and pawpaws. Uh, I've seen them in as small as four inch pots. Typically they'll come in a, a gallon size pot, which is about five inches deep and they just keep shrinking and shrinking. And I think it's just the commercialization and the money making uh, that, that a lot of nurseries are jumping on. And it really does sacrifice the longevity and health. Uh, I mean, you're, you're messing with its natural tendency. You're, 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 you're reshaping that taproot. You're cramping. It's probably cramped in there. It's cramped. It's, uh, yes. Now, I've talked to Neil Peterson about this recently. And, you know, he says that he's seen, you know, the trees sort of pulled up, you know, after a number of years that were started in these small pots. 
and, and the pawpaw regrows a tap root or sometimes two or three tap roots. So the tree is adaptive, but you, you've, in my, in my opinion, you, you, you're stunting it. You're affecting its longevity and its health from the get-go by messing with that natural tendency to have a deep tap root. And I think certainly in its early years, it's going to be more drought sensitive. So I think you're, you're potentially going to get more failure in the first couple of years of growing your pawpaws by having those short pots. Now, unfortunately, it's hard to find uh, deep pots. I do have a good resource that uh, you can post, uh, a, a man called Charles West. He grows pawpaws the right way in deep pots with a lot of care, and he does ship them. He's in New Jersey. I wouldn't really recommend buying them bare root. Some people will dig them up and mail them, and I think you're probably going 50-50 on their success rate uh, by doing that. They, they, they just don't like to be they don't like to be messed with that root. You have to take care for a couple of years, and then once the tree is established, it's totally carefree. It really kind of has this like two-year infancy, and then in year three, it even changes the way it looks, and it just gets robust, and it and it really starts to go. Mm, so it's established. Once that root feels established and safe, it can do its thing. <laughs> yeah. So you have your little seedlings that you planted. You put them in pots or in the ground, and then... Do you recommend that you you should graft to be sure to get a tasty fruit? Now, yes. Now, now pawpaws come pretty true to heredity, uh, also sometimes called true to seed. Um, so certain fruits, you know, will be very much like their parents, like a peach, right? A lot of stone fruits come true to seed, very much like their parents. They'll be a similar quality. Uh, to their parents. Now, pawpaws are probably in the 80 to 100 percent mm. range of uh, true to seedness. So that means if you are collecting seed from an orchard that's all grafted varieties, right? So all the cross pollination is from really good varieties. Like here on our homestead, you know, I'm I'm working upward of 40 different varieties, almost all grafted. Uh, I don't have wild pawpaws flowering right around me. I do have wild pawpaws growing in the woods here, literally, uh, but they're not flowering because they're in the shade. So I know that the seeds that I'm getting from my pawpaws have all come from, you know, select cultivars. So if I grow that out, and and we call those select seedlings. So sometimes in the nursery industry now, you'll see something called a select seedling. That means that it's coming from, you know, a high quality parents. That will turn into be a, a good producer and good tasting fruit. It will not be a named cultivar, but you will get a good fruit. Now you will not get the assurance that you would that you you know that you would get from grafting. That little bit of extra insurance will you'll know that you what you're going to get flavor wise. You know you're going to get in consistency and even you know how much fruit set you'll be getting each year. So it depends on 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 what you're after. But now the opposite end of that spectrum is, is, is a whole group of people who are really adamant about the wild pawpaw, foraging for the wild pawpaw, and celebrating the wild pawpaw, which I really respect as well. There are good paw wild pawpaws to be found, and really a lot of the cultivars that you can find are just wild selections. You know, some, some, someone has been out, you know, hunting pawpaws and has found a pawpaw tree that has this amazing fruit and then has gone ahead and taken that and grafted that. So then taken the cyan wood and cloned it and started selling that as a variety. Do you know if any studies have been done on the nutritional um, components of the wild versus the domesticated pawpaws? Does That's the nutritional a, value always question. lessen? I, I would say there's definitely going to be a difference. Now, Kentucky State University uh, is, the, is the lead institution uh, doing research on pawpaws and has a, a real wealth of pawpaw information on their website. And they get into the nutritional qualities. They're doing a lot of trials. You know, I think they're trying to see if this can become a commercial fruit as well. Uh, and, and there are definitely flavor differences. Uh, I think there's differences in, in some of the medicinal compounds in the fruit between varieties. Uh, it might be subtle, but yes, there are differences. And there's certainly a lot of flavor differences in the varieties. So 
I would say the most publicly popular Paul Paul is the Shenandoah. This is one of Neil Peterson's select Paul Paul varieties. And it's very popular because it's it's sweet. It's on the sweet side. The flavors are subtle uh, and not overwhelming. Now, I think generally that appeals to the broader public. But then there's us out there that, you know, like really rich, funky flavors. Like I like durian, to give yeah. you an example. <laughs> right? so, 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 so there are pawpaws that really have that rich, complex, really kind of, to some people, overwhelming flavors. Okay, so you have your pawpaws, they're either grafted or you've grown them from seed, hoping, you know, that they taste really good. How do you love your pawpaw tree um, or trees so they love you back with excellent fruit? Do you mulch them or what what do they like? Yes, lots of mulch. So like almost all fruit trees, you know, they've developed in a woodland setting. So they have close uh, relationships, you know, with, with fungi, you know, the mycelium is an important element, you know, I think for all, really all fruit, fruiting trees, all trees, because they've developed in a woodland setting where that's how they developed. So lots of mulch, a lot of good woody material, wood chips and straw that are breaking down and creating that, that fungal mat that's pulling in the extra nutrients for the trees is, I think is always critical and very much with the pawpaw. And it, it, that added moisture is very critical and important to the pawpaw, uh, which is not really wants constant humidity and moisture pull to maintain its leaves and that big fruit. So yes, so uh, when I plant out my pawpaws, like most of my, my trees, I will plant a nitrogen fixer, you know, right with it, pretty much in the same hole or within a foot or two of the plant. Uh, sometimes in permaculture, these are called nurse plants. And so I like to work with the lead plant. It's a prairie plant that's a woody perennial in the legume family. So it fixes nitrogen through its roots and it's feeding the pawpaw and, and the deer don't eat it too. So that's another big, big bonus for me. Uh, so what I'll do is I will chop and drop that lead plant, which is a vigorous grower. So it's not really ever getting in the way of the growing pawpaw yet feeding it. So every time I chop and drop it, I'm dropping mulch, but when the top is cut the corresponding roots underground you know you know die off and release nitrogen at the same time so i'm chopping and dropping i'm mulching and fertilizing i can move through a couple acres of food forest and i can chop and drop in half an hour and i would mulch and fertilized and then i can be back in the hammock or doing yoga or whatever um, so it's a really efficient design to be putting in your fertility and your mulch up front you know, comfries are another great one. I have running comfries as well. So a lot of people are familiar with the standalone comfrey, but I've got these great runners. There's, there's a couple out there. I have one that's about 24 inches tall with a light blue flower. That's a great ground cover. And then I have one that's 12 inches tall with a white flower that I got from the Bullock Brothers that also runs and creates a nice, you know, mat that is mulching and dropping, you know, its leaves as fertility on the surface. So you know, the pawpaw eventually, you know, will shade out almost everything below it because it has the big leaves. So really, I work a lot up front with, with designing these sort of fertility and mulch guilds for the pawpaw to kind of get them pumped up and get them started. Um, and then, of course, constant mulch in the long run is really important as well. Now, I've noticed in our neck of the woods, you know, we have a lot of black locust. I see the black locust and the pawpaw growing well together. The black locust has a smaller leaf, so it allows more light to come through it, which allows understory plants to develop and even fruit better. So I'm starting to work with the black locust as my nurse plant. So I'll let that grow with it or next to it, and I'll keep chopping and dropping it because it's also a nitrogen fixer. And, you know, and if I forget about getting around to it and it grows a little bit too much, that small leaf cover is still going to allow light for that pawpaw to develop. And really, if you get ahead of your game, you could put your your locust in, you know, a couple of years before you plant your pawpaw so that it has that first year or two of shade for you. And then you just keep cutting back the black locust. Eventually, you know, you pretty much can phase the black locust out because you want to be cutting it back hard as a chop and drop. It's a nurse plant that's there just to jumpstart your trees. This is interesting. Yeah. So it's about the relationships that the pawpaw has with other plants that can help it really grow. 
Yes, yeah, because you can't really imitate that kind of fertility. It, the, the, the fertility that is fixed through the nitrogen nodules, the bacteria on nitrogen-fixing plants is very bioavailable to the plants around it. So, you know, going out and, you know, supplementing with manures and composts and all that, it's not even it's not even as good as what can be available to it through the ground already. Now, I'm not saying I don't. I do I do bring in manure. We have, you know, a lot of horses around us. Um, so I will actually supplement feed my pawpaw trees, you know, along with everything else that I'm doing because I am kind of getting a lot of harvest off of them. But I'll add in another note there. So pawpaws, you know, cultivars in full sun, well-loved, will produce like 50 pounds, sometimes more uh, per tree. But that is actually not ideal. Like So like with a lot of fruit trees, you want to manage fruit set and you want to actually keep it down a little bit for the health and the longevity of the tree. So with the pawpaws, you actually want to target more about 35 pounds per season and actually thin out fruit as hard as that is to do. Uh, you you want to go and you want to thin some of that excess fruit out so that your tree will maintain its balance and then you will also get more consistent bearing year to year. So if you're not caring for your fruit set, you know, one year you'll get a whole bunch of fruit, the next year you won't get so much and then you'll also begin to weaken the tree by doing that. So you know, very much like with almost almost fruit trees, certainly with the pawpaw, you want to sort of manage that abundance. And I think, too, that the flowers and pollination, I'd love to talk just a bit about that. The flowers are really unusual, and they kind of remind me of the corpse flower, you know, the flower that blooms <laughs> and the, <laughs> doesn't have a great smell, um, hence the name. But I think the main pollinators of pawpaws are flies, right? Yeah. So it, it is actually a really pretty pendulous like purple maroon flower and it, it comes out pretty early in the spring and is mostly pollinated by the fly and it, and, and some beetles and it puts out a, a really interesting smell more like a yeasty bread so I don't think it's it's not foul at all you know I think it's got a little bit of a bad rep you know you don't have to worry about you know planting these you know next to your front door it's not going to be offensive uh, so it's like a yeasty, you know, like a sourdough smell. And, you know, I, I find, and I'm working with this uh, in permaculture ways where in my food forest systems where I'm growing my pawpaws, I'm planting it with other early flowering uh, plants like black currants, uh, June berries, gummies, so that are all flowering at the same time, just so there's more activity, you know, there's more life, there's more movement in that whole zone. Uh, of course, we we have woods around us, and, you know, we have sort of a, a healthy, abundant, diverse ecosystem that, so we don't have any challenges with pollination. We have, I've never had any problems with pollination. There's plenty uh, around us. Now, the more Paul Pauls, the merrier, of course. I think you know you're you're, you're going to draw in more of these pollinators with the more that you have. Now, now some ecosystems, some some environments, maybe just won't have the flies that busy or that abundant, and you can go out and you can very easily uh, pollinate the tree yourself with a very soft, you know, paintbrush, a small painting brush, and when the pollen just starts to turn brown on the anthers. Um, you can go ahead and just dab your, your brush in one flower, go to the next, just dab around because they, they, they're almost a perfect flower in that they do have the male-female uh, ratio. It's just that they have a slightly different timing for releasing and accepting uh, the pollen. So uh, it actually is very successfully done with just a paintbrush. I haven't, I haven't had to do that um, you know, because we have a good environment for it. Also because I grow quite a few and I create diverse environments, you know, just for insect life. Uh, but, you know, on a small scale, you will get good fruit set. Um, and then those flowers, you know, you'll get like clusters. So you'll get a cluster of like you can potentially get nine pawpaws growing, you know, in a cluster. Wow. Um, so, you know, it, it does. It sounds like a lot of work to go out there and pollinate, but you really it's not much and you will get a lot of of fruit if you even if you just have to hand pollinate does the fruit fall when it's ripe and then i could see how the mulch would be like a nice little cushion for the yes fruit. yeah i mean you're talking a large fruit you know you're talking you know you know often half a pound you know or you know more commonly a pound on your cultivars uh so yeah when it's ripe it's definitely going to fall 
um, and they bruise easily. So ideally, you hand pick your fruit just when it's beginning to turn, and you can tell they're 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 rock hard. You know, they're green and rock hard until they are ready. And usually, late August is the earliest that you'll find them beginning to turn. September is prime time, and they're tailing off into early October. Um, some of the cultivars will begin to change color. Uh, they'll start to turn from sort of a, 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 a solid green to sort of a, a more yellow green. And some will turn, you know, quite yellow, quite obvious. Like PA Golden will turn quite obviously yellow. I think a lot of the wild ones turn quite obviously yellow. And, but when you go up and you, and you want to squeeze it gently, and it's like a peach. You know, when you squeeze a peach and it's, and it's ready, it just starts to yield, it's juicy. The pawpaw is the same way. When it just, if you feel like a little bit of movement, like it's pushing in when you, when you squeeze it a little bit, it's ready. And you can pull it off the tree and you can put it in a box, but don't stack fruit on top of it. You know, it's very sensitive um, to bruising. So you want to handle it gently. If you bring that inside and you leave it on your counter, You'll have in about two days, it'll probably be just right. It'll be very aromatic. Uh, the flesh will still be pretty firm. The flavors will be fresh and, and very clear. Now, if about day three, day four, it's really going to turn the corner quickly, kind of like a banana once it's peeled. The, it's still edible, but the flavor profile is going to switch. It's going to become more complex. Uh, I find it come almost like coffee tones. Uh, you might get a little bit more of a bitterness to it. And some people like that. So it's really kind of interesting how you play with it uh, in those regards. Even even one variety can taste different depending on when you're going to eat it. Now, if you eat a pawpaw before it's really ready, it'll mess with your stomach. You mm. know, it, it'll clean you out, et cetera, et cetera. So that's another one of these things why I'm writing uh, many manuals. I want people to ha kind of have more of an understanding, you know, about how to harvest and work and, you know, when you – find a pawpaw, you know, when to and when not to eat it, uh, you know, for your own good. Um, but, but if you handpick it, and then if you, you can refrigerate it, you know, for almost a couple of weeks if you've handpicked it at the right time, you know, it can actually have a, you know, a refrigeration life two, three weeks. Uh, otherwise, you can pulp it and freeze it, and it freezes well for a year or more. So it's, it's, a, it's something you have to really work with in a short amount of time, but then can be stored You've been saying how pawpaws are very delicate and easily bruised. Do you think that's part of the reason why we don't see them in supermarkets so much? Absolutely. Yeah, they don't have a shelf life, and so they don't fit into commercialization uh, in food networks, current food networks. And processing the pulp is actually quite challenging, too. Uh, they're, they're beginning, like KSU, Kentucky State University, and Chris Chamel, who has integration acres in Ohio, um, he's a permaculture guy who's been working with the pawpaw for 20 years. He's also the founder of the Ohio Pawpaw Festival. You know, I think he's developed machinery as well to try and process it. But, on, you know, on a small scale, it's time consuming uh, to process the pawpaw. So that's a bottleneck right now. That can change. You know, I think with more, you know, interest, interest industry interest in the pawpaw, we could get machinery developed for it. It's being worked on. Now, Jim Davis of um, Deep Run Pawpaw Orchard has the largest pawpaw commercial operation in the world. He lives near me, too. Uh, and he's a good friend who, for 20 years, has been growing about 1,000 pawpaw trees on about 10 acres. Now, it's kind of monoculture, uh, but it's also very interesting and a lot of feedback uh, from his experience, some of which will go in my book as well. But he, he is shipping them out. You know, he will put them in flat boxes and he will overnight them, you know, to boutique shops in New York City or to chefs or to other distributors. So it is actually getting out there, but it takes focus. It takes care. It takes time, which is not what commercialization is really all about. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's really exciting to see this resurgence in pawpaw. The interest in pawpaw is rising. Locally, people can work with them, right? And just go to their local farmer and pawpaw grower. It's kind of a double-edged sword, right? With with plants that become very popular. Yes. It's a fine line. 
Yeah, and I don't know if the Paul Paul will go there. You know, I don't know if the Paul Paul will really want to adapt to commercialization. You know, it might really keep holding itself back and throwing up, you know, too big a challenges for it to happen. And and it has to be a locavore movement. You know, it has to be things that are grown yourself or the local farmers market. You know, I think it has something that roots us to 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 place. You know, I really kind of, I don't want to get too woo-woo here, but, you know, there's, there's some real, there's some real deep woodland magic uh, that, that, that you connect with when you work with the pawpaw. It is interesting because I always think, oh, I don't want to get so woo-woo either, but working with plants a lot, it does, it's this different energy. It's the botanical yeah. energy versus the human. It's, it's interesting. Yeah. Um, so tell us a bit about your book that you're going that you're writing. I think now um, for the love of pawpaws, and you're using Kickstarter to raise funds to publish this book. And tell people a bit about how they can get a hold of the book and support your project. Right, right. So here we are in March of 2018, and uh, yeah, I'm taking on a new publication uh, called uh, For the Love of Pawpaws, and I'm calling it a mini manual for my own good as much as anything. I'm trying not to write a big book here. And I'm trying to really make it very how-to focused. Um, you know, I'm calling it seed to table. So it will cover a lot of, you know, how you work with growing pawpaws, um, you know, how you care for them, how you harvest them, how you process them, some great recipes. And then, you know, also a little bit about pawpaw culture, pawpaw resources, and a very colorful attractive and interactive way to really broaden the audience as well and then also bring in permaculture aspects but not really wave that banner really trying to make this appeal uh, to mainstream and really really ulti my ultimate goal in most all that I do is to stimulate perennial agriculture uh, so if the idea is to get more trees more multi-purpose trees planted and how to do that and right now there's an interest in pawpaws uh, and I'm working with that interest to have more pawpaw trees growing. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm appealing to the foodies, you know, I'm appealing to the gardeners, uh, really kind of, you know, a, a nice broad net um, that makes it easy to, to sort of jump into. And yeah, uh, I'm going to self-publish like I did my first book. And to do that, I'm doing a Kickstarter until March 25th. So uh, maybe the first listeners uh, can help support, you know, and be part of this, uh, this Paul Paul revolution here. Uh, otherwise, uh, if, if life permits, maybe by the end of the year, uh, the book, or probably early next year, probably 2019, the book will be coming out, uh, and you can, you can uh, get a copy. If you do donate to the Kickstarter, you can get your name onto the Paw Paw Wall of Heroes, <laughs> 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 which I really want to be on that wall. I better... <laughs> We'll put you on there. We'll I love the idea. Um, so for people who want to be involved, how can they find you online? Our, our website, ecologiadesign.com, uh, is a wealth of information. It has a lot of good how-to on it already. A lot of things from my first book, Edible Landscaping with a Permaculture Twist. You know, everything from growing mushrooms outside to building herb spirals to swales, culture beds, food forests, Uncommon fruits, of course, now lots about pawpaws. And, you know, and if you're in our region, we do a lot of uh, really fun events, tours, uh, open houses. You know, we've got a circular straw bale house. That's a really awesome thing to have a look at. You know, a budding permaculture homestead. Uh, it's a really kind of fascinating place to come and visit if you're in the region. So you, you, you'd see about that on our website as well. Great. And that's E-C-O-L-O-G-I-A design.com. And if people want to visit, um, go to the third annual Long Creek Homestead Pawpaw Festival. When is that happening this year? That's the third Saturday in September, September 22nd. Um, we'll have tickets. We had to do it at a ticket event. It's so popular that we get overrun if we don't. So uh, upcoming here, I will probably post, you know, the way to get tickets to come. So, yeah, it's a great experience. It, you know, the Paul Paul is the headliner, but when you come here, you get to see the food forests, you know, our, our circular straw bale house, all the different designs and things that we have going on. Uh, so I kind of use the Paul Paul as the headliner, and we do. We we have lots of pawpaws, uh, a lot of different varieties to test. We have, we make pawpaw jam on a rocket stove. Uh, we have homemade ice cream that we're making. It's it's a lot of fun for kids all ages. And and oh, this year we're going to build a couple cob ovens and, and do some do some pizzas. 
And there's just this excitement, this energy that happens when you get a bunch of pawpaws and a bunch of people together. It's really uh, electric. Oh, that's great. Um, I would love to chat with you before we go about some value added products that you can make from pawpaws. And I think beer is one, ice cream. Can you tell us a bit about that? And um, I don't know if we have time, maybe share a recipe. Yeah. So pawpaws, they kind of get divided into two categories, you know, eating it fresh uh, and then sort of cooking with it. And it, and it really kind of changes the, the flavor profiles and the experience changes. So I, I think most people are a fan of just eating it fresh. Uh, you get all of the very subtle nuances and the really sort of um, amazing aromas because it's a very aromatic fruit and it's a really tropical experience uh, when you're eating it. And then next best to eating it fresh is an ice cream. Because again, you know, it's raw, right? You're not you're not heating the, the pawpaw at all. So it makes delicious ice cream and sorbets and gelatos. Um, you know, there's vegan recipes, you know, and there's good old-fashioned homemade ice cream. And it is delicious. You do not have to do very much at all, really. If you're if you're doing old-fashioned ice cream, it's just, you know, it's half and half pulp. You really don't need sugar. If you do, use half, you know, maybe like half a cup per, you know, per ice cream maker. And a little bit of dash of vanilla is nice. It goes well with it. And it is exquisite. People go crazy. At our pawpaw festival, there's a long line for the, for the, for the ice cream <laughs> every time. Um, you know, from there, it, it does really well in custards, especially if you're kind of doing it like a, like, a, like a steam bath, you know, where you're not heating it very much. So it goes very well with the custard elements of sugar and eggs and um, heavy cream. I just made a, a zabaglione, which is like an Italian custard. Did some recipe development for the book that is exquisite. That's really nice. Now, when you begin to, like if you bake with the pawpaw, if you're going to make pawpaw cookies or pawpaw bread, it, it really mellows out and it becomes a little more elusive. Um, it, to me, it almost is more like banana in a recipe. You can also make pawpaw preserves, and that's kind of more of a cooking it down on the stove for a longer period of time. That changes the complexity and really brings out almost like a caramel richness with a little bit of bitterness that actually works pretty well. Uh, especially if you put on a little bit of shortbread, it's really exquisite. And I take that to my talks a lot so people get an experience. But really, it runs the gamut uh, of flavors uh, when you, you know, from fresh to cooked. Now, one thing, don't make fruit leather out of it. You know, people are reportedly getting nauseous from eating fruit leather uh, for whatever reasons, probably because you're you're concentrating the natural medicinal qualities in it. Um, and, and that can be experienced sometimes with, you know, even cooking it with preserves or something too long. Um, but, you know, I wouldn't really be afraid of it. It's not, you know, if, if it does happen to a few individuals, it's not really, you know, that common. But, um, uh, you know, look for opportunities to buy frozen pulp out of season to give it a shot. Otherwise, September is, is your best bet to be looking for them. What has surprised you the most about working with pawpaws? Hmm. I would I would say what surprises me most about pawpaws is their adaptability and their abundance. So they are they are they are willing and ready to move out of the woods and to be grown, you know, in, in our sort of human designed uh, landscape and to flourish with low care and then produce abundantly and offer up, you know, medicinal qualities and again, you know, that connectivity you know, to the woods. So I think they're really kind of, you know, looking for interaction, uh, you know, with us as a species as well. That is so great. You're like a plant ambassador for pawpaws. Well, that, that's kind of, that's kind of what I, yeah, that's what I say. I'm, I, I'm an ambassador and, and, and I feel like, yes, that the, you know, the pawpaw is, is uh, working with me and I'm, and I had, you know, I had kind of a pretty good deep insight or feeling uh, a couple of weeks ago and, and it was that, you know, that, that somehow I'm, I'm supposed to help people, you know, connect with the, with the root, you know, mm. the, this, this pawpaw tap root, this tree is somehow I'm supposed to be helping people, I don't know, you know, really come, come into that. Cause I know that's what, you know, so much is needed. We, we need roots and pawpaw has got a deep tap root, you know, there's something there. 
uh, that I think is drawing me as much as anything to to work with with talking about it and spreading it. Mm-hmm. That's like the plant language, right? It's almost like a feeling or like an intuition or it's something. Yeah. This is so exciting. And so is there anything else you want to add about pawpaws today? Oh, just, um, you know, learn more about them, support my Kickstarter. Um, you know, just look for your opportunity to try them, I would say, and, and just know that they have this connection, you know, with the woods and, and ancient times that, that, that we really need more and more these days. Thank you so much, Michael. It's been so much fun to learn about pawpaws and talk with you again. Yeah, thank, thank you, Jill. And pawpaws to the people. You've been listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. You can find us online at sustainableworldradio.com and also on iTunes. For more information about permaculture and ecology, visit the Sustainable World Media YouTube channel, where you'll find videos about permaculture, aquaponics, organic gardening, rainwater harvesting, and much, much more. Sustainable World Radio is a listener-supported program. If you like what we do, please consider making a donation to the show. I'm your host and producer, Jill Cloutier, and thank you so much for listening. 